So you just see these different functional connectivity networks and that's really how it's working. That's how uh, my understanding of these different brain circuits turning on and off, depending on where your awareness and your perception is, uh, has shaped my understanding of what's happening in meditation. And that's really what the Muse device rewards are those alpha theta frequencies. So I think that going through different focus points um, opens up these different brain pathways and you can use the Muse to ground yourself back into um, the alpha theta and in doing those processes and going through the, these different techniques and exercises, you can really get really, really good meditation sessions. Hey guys, it's Dr. Cody Roll with Tech for Psych. This video is an adaptation of a lecture that I gave at a medical school last week. If you are primarily interested in brain circuits identified through neuroimaging and how that relates to meditation and neurofeedback using the Muse, head to about 17 minutes in. The prior 15 minutes go through my background, the history of neuroimaging, and sort of set the stage for the rest of the conversation. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you're interested in coaching, head to www.techforsych.com coaching for an application to work with me. Thanks so much, hope you enjoy. Hey guys, Dr. Cody Rawl here. So this is a lecture that I developed for the local medical school, but I wanted to put it up on this YouTube channel because it gives a good description of neuroimaging and how it's come along and how things like functional MRI are allowing us to see things that we've never seen before, especially when it comes to brain circuits turning on and off and being different in different psychopathology. And we're going to apply it to what I've been doing with the Muse meditation. So just so you know, I'm not some random dude that's talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, to give you a, a bit of background on where I came from, so I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, was sort of an outdoorsy guy, hunting a lot with my dad. Um, doing the normal Alaskan things, grew up playing hockey, decided I wanted to go to medical school and in knowing that I wanted to do that, went to undergraduate biology at University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, I graduated with my biology degree, got into medical school, went to Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago, and then decided that I wanted to take my training further, obviously, into uh, psychiatry. So I knew I wanted either between neurology and psychiatry because I wanted to know neuroscience, I wanted to know the brain, and I was very, very interested in the interface between technology and the brain. And at looking at different specialties, it actually became apparent to me that psychiatry had so much to offer because of the skills that it developed in you, but also in the broad horizon of innovation that was uh, available in, in the field. And right off the bat, my intern year, I was able to rotate at, and use some of the most intense brain imaging technology that I've ever heard about. And uh, the reason why that was possible in large part was because I was being trained at Walter Reed Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, it's an incredible environment. They got National Institute of Health right across the street. Uh, right there on campus, you had this building called the NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. There was a billionaire by the name of Fisher that wanted to give back to veterans and in doing so has built these sites all across the country. And each site uh, typically focuses on a different area of recovery for people. Uh, they're multidisciplinary, well comprehensive treatment sites, but some of them focus on like amputees and others focus on brain imaging. And the first one that was built was there in Bethesda, Maryland, focused on brain imaging. So I had access to this incredible facility. They had a machine there that I did one of my first YouTube videos on called Magnetic Encephalography. And there's a, only a handful of these in the States from what I'm aware of. And it's this machine that usually when you are measuring brain waves with EEG, like what the Muse does, uh, you are detecting direct electrical waves. So when the neurons fire, thousands of neurons fire, they create something called a local field potential that affects the voltage. And we, you can pick that up when there's a lead on your head and they call that EEG, electroencephalography. The difference with magnetic encephalography is that when a neuron fires, it creates a tangential magnetic field. And this machine can pick up that field. It's got these super cooled sensors called squids that are super cooled by helium making them extra sensitive. The room is barricaded against the Earth's magnetic field. And these sensors pick up these tiny, minute magnetic fields that are coming off of the brain. And they were doing really groundbreaking PTSD research there with the mag that I was able to be around and be a part of. 
And uh, as my rotations went on, I started rotating more and more in the traumatic brain injury ward. There was a nationally renowned um, neuropsychiatrist there by the name of Dr. Williamson that specialized in traumatic brain injury. It was pretty prestigious ward. Uh, I know President Obama came to visit a couple of times uh, because we had uh, war veterans there and we were doing uh, really groundbreaking stuff. Uh, Dr. Williamson also specialized in early onset dementia. So there would be really these really sad cases, but uh, we get these people in the early 50s coming in with memory loss and memory difficulties uh, much sooner than should be the case for something like Alzheimer's disease. And we are using this really sophisticated brain imaging technology called positron emission tomography that uses radio tracers that you inject into the patient. They get their brain scanned, and then you can see, like for instance, the activity of glucose metabolism in the brain. Uh, it's called an FDG glucose PET. Or you could do some kind of radio tracer that binds to things like alpha beta plaques and Alzheimer's disease to see if that was a plaque buildup causing an uh, Alzheimer's disease like clinical picture. And, you know, not 10, 20 years earlier, the only way that you could actually see this kind of stuff was through autopsy. So this was cutting edge uh, postural emission tomography research that's still going on today. Um, and then, you know, during my time there, I became more and more interested in the interface between technology and the mind. And one of the easy insertion points to that, rather than, uh, you know, trying to get a research rotation that was going to take months and months, an easy insertion point was to EEG, because EEG had been developed into these small mobile devices. And uh, one of my mentors in the intensive outpatient program had started incorporating the use of these devices with patients. And that was really inspiring. He published a paper on the accessibility and usability of one of the original uh, devices, NeuroSky, and was moving into research using the Muse at the time. And I took a several week course of bio and neurofeedback to get formally trained in that. So that sort of set the stage for what I'm doing now. Uh, concurrently, in the third year of my program there, I got a random email from um, the American Psychiatric Association saying we're putting on something called the Psychiatry Innovation Lab. And it was this idea where you submit ideas for innovations in psychiatry, and if you get uh, selected, you can go down and present your ideas Shark Tank style in front of a panel of judges in a live audience, get feedback, and potentially win prize money. And that was really formative because even though I didn't make it out of the semifinal round for my crazy idea on uh, brain research that I wanted to do, uh, I met the right people, uh, got incorporated into the Psychiatry Innovation Lab team. We now have the Innovation Zone at the APA every year where talks on innovation are given all day uh, throughout the uh, week-long APA experience. And we have the Psychiatry Innovation Lab typically on that Sunday where uh, the finalists where finalists had submitted YouTube videos are curated by us and then um, selected to give their talks and on innovations in mental health. And last year we raised something like $50,000. It was incredible and big props to the uh, education department, their APA for leading the way on that. Um, but that's been a very positive experience. And then, um, you know, from that leapfrogging into what's become Stanford Brainstorm that Nina Voss and MD is running, where we get uh, involvement of the business school of Stanford, the development school, the law school, all coming together with the mental health department to determine new ways of innovation in mental health. And the reason why I built bring all this up is just a little bit of background on me, but also to discuss the point how I got uh, involved with Muse research. Um, met some uh, people in Muse through Psychiatry Innovation Lab and had also been putting up videos on various technology products and uh, has led to a relationship where I'm doing research uh, with the Muse. Um, it's had its shares of up and ups and downs but has been very fruitful I think and has uh, shaped my views on uh, how people can get involved with neurotechnology on the consumer level. And I think is an ongoing revolution that's happening where people are becoming more and more interested in the interface between technology and the mind. So this is some background on neuroimaging that I did for the medical students in this lecture. Around the turn of the century, uh, we were aware that if you put x-rays through people and put a film behind them, you could get these images. And this worked really well for the chest because there was this contrast between the air and the lungs and the bone. 
and uh, your heart silhouette, but it doesn't work very well for the brain because the brain is this thick 3D structure that has a lot of soft matter and not a whole lot of contrast. So what early doctors were doing, which was actually quite barbaric, is that they would actually drain a little bit of the cerebral spinal fluid out of people through a lumbar puncture, and then they would inject a little bit of air into their uh, central nervous system. And as you can imagine, this was very deleterious. It made people sick, made them want to throw up, uh, gave them headaches, and they would put them on this turn tilt table so that the air would go up and down and around different areas of their head so they could get some imaging with the x-rays. Not a very good process. Uh, through the 30s and 40s, as we became more aware of radio tracers, they were able to do cerebral angiography with that to take a look at the vasculature that was feeding the brain. But again, not until the 1970s or 80s were we really able to actually see the brain without doing an autopsy. And you can see that image there from one of the first CT scans in 1975 of the brain, very low resolution. Um, but was uh, a big step forward. We now had computing power. We could take the x-ray images and put them into little slices that composed the uh, CT that we know of today. And uh, concurrently, in the 80s and 90s, uh, MRI uh, continued to improve, so we could do uh, neuroimaging with MRI, which is better for soft tissue imaging. And uh, some of the teaching points for the medical students was that CT scans are better for detecting blood, like if you, you got your head injured and you needed to determine in the emergency room if you had a quick bleed, that's when you get a CT scan. But if you have something that's messing with the soft tissue of the brain, that's when you go for uh, the MRI. And a, a good case, a good example of that would be multiple, scler multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune disorder that attacks the white matter of the brain and can cause things like uh, temporary blindness, um, nerve paralysis, weakness on one side of the body, etc. Not a very nice picture, but... Um, easy to, uh, or at least easier to identify with brain MRI that made that possible. So, uh, you know, along that time where we're getting the structural imag imaging of the brain underway, we are developing our techniques for looking at the functional part of the brain. <clears throat> In 1920, Hans Berger came along and proved that you could uh, get traces of voltage activity from the brain from something called EEG. And EEG has been with us for some time, so ever since then, uh, developing, slowly developing. You can see in this picture that it was from a machine that took up half of a room and, uh, you know, downsizing down, down, down into what we have with the Muse device now, which has been shown to be uh, uh, comparable in medical grade uh, EEG signal and being processed with our phones. And as the smartphone processor gets uh, more and more robust, the more data that we can use and the more accurate it will get. Uh, and you even see that with magnetic encephalography now, uh, it's downsizing. Even the machine that I was using um, just five years ago has been downsized in some labs to this much smaller cap that has these magnetic sensors that go into these slots on top of the scalp and no longer require this magnetic shielded room, which is simply amazing. You can see the downsizing happening year by year with this technology as it becomes more and more accessible to the general population, more portable and less expensive. Something that uh, really shaped my views and how the brain works is rhythms of the brain. I've talked about this guy in previous talks of mine. His name is Gheorghe Bushaki. He's a neuroscientist at New York University School of Medicine. Uh, if you're interested in doing some really dense reading and understanding how these brain circuits communicate to each other in almost like an alphabet of the brain by different frequency patterns, read his book, Rhythms of the Brain. It really, again, has shaped my views on how all this is possible. Um, and a lot of the neuroscience research that's coming out and the way that we understand how different medications affect different receptors in the brain has been through positron emission tomography. So that same brain scan technology that I talked about that we're using with uh, early onset dementia patients and traumatic brain injury patients where you inject a radio ligand tracer into a person and then track the activity of that tracer. So you can get different compounds that compete for dopamine receptors or different compounds that compete for serotonin receptors. And that's how we get the drug affinities for the, for the medications that we use in mental health. And that's how uh, different Researchers like Nora Valco can uh, do her research. She's a, the head of the Institute for um, 
addictive disorders and came to do a talk or two at Walter Reed while I was there, um, there in Bethesda, Maryland. And this study is illustrating um, the difference between someone that's addict- addicted to cocaine to a control that's not addicted to cocaine. What they did was show videos of people smoking crack cocaine. And what they noticed is that the people that were addicted to cocaine had a bigger surge in dopamine levels in their brain than people that were not addicted to cocaine, indicating that uh, cravings have to do with this dopamine surge. And the way that they can do this is they have this radio ligand that competes with endogenous dopamine. And through using positron emission tomography, they inject radio ligand, they have the person watch the video while they're in their scanner, and they notice that within the scanner, the addicts don't get as much uptake of their radio tracer as the controls because they're having more endogenous dopamine being released in the brain, uh, signifying that they're experiencing these cravings. So that's how the positron emission tomography works. Um, There's another version of positron emission tomography, or at least a brain scan that's somewhat similar to it called SPECT, and it's cheaper and it uh, detects blood flow over time. And SPECT has been famously used by Daniel Amen to uh, initiate the development of his Amen clinics. He was under a lot of fire in the early 2000s for trying to use this technique uh, with patients, uh, you know, the medical community basically shunning him, ostracizing him, saying that these brain scans uh, were not necessary for treatment. And I'm not saying whether or not they were necessary for treatment. I will say, though, that I think that Daniel Amen was about 10 to 20 years uh, too early, that these um, brain imaging technologies that we're going to talk about in this talk really are setting the stage in the second and third generation of using brain imaging for treatment of psychiatric disorders. And as you can see, or as you will see, it's becoming more and more nuanced and much more uh, specific than what you would see here with a spec scan. <clears throat> this is Tom Insel. I interviewed him back in May. He was the uh, head of National Institute of Mental Health for 13 years before transitioning into a San Francisco startup for mental health. Uh, he's famous for saying that, you know, we've basically failed you as a profession, that the diagnostic manual for psychiatry based on observations, uh, subjective observations is obsolete. We need to be incorporating things like brain scans, genetics, and other biomarkers to be more specific in diagnoses and tracking if treatment is working or not. And a lot of this new innovation, of course, is coming from new brain imaging technology that I'm gonna talk about right now. So this brings us to the infamous functional MRI, the brain scanning technology that has revolutionized our understanding of the brain in the last 20 years. MRI, of course, works as uh, you have this giant magnet that sets up a magnetic field, and then you have radio pulses that affect water molecules, and different tissues have different uh, water content, so that sets up the contrast. Depending on how much water and lipids the tissue has in it, uh, it's gonna react differently to those radio pulses when you set up the magnetic field. And there's different types of MRI and that has to do with setting up the magnetic field differently and the radio pulses differently and computing the data differently. But the two main ones are um, functional MRI, which takes a look at uh, blood flow changes in the brain, and tractography, which takes a look at the uh, communication pathways, the myelin sheaths of the brain. And since myelin sheaths run in a certain direction and the water molecules vibrate, along the plane of uh, direction of the communication pathways, you can actually use a computer to map out where those pathways are. And the different colors represent different orientations in space. So uh, red might be left or right here on the picture, whereas blue might be up and down. And, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of really interesting stuff with tractography as well, even to the level of predicting how people are going to do on certain tasks, like uh, music or arithmetic based on the amount of uh, white matter communication between different areas of the brain that is measured through tractography. Super spooky stuff, but um, really cool at the same time. So functional MRI is, uh, again, the measure of the blood flow changes that happen in the brain. And you can do this with someone that's just laying there, or you can do this with someone that is going through active mental tasks. And this has really set up all the data for understanding of how the brain is working in certain environments. So functional MRI has made us realize that there's different circuits in the brain that turn on and off depending on what you're doing. And the most famous one is the default mode network. So this is Marcus Rakeley, uh, who was doing research down at uh, Washington University in St. Louis uh, with a big fMRI lab. 
and this was in the early 2000s and 2001, he coined the term default mode network, but they were taking a look at people and having them go through different mental tasks and functional MRI machines. But uh, when they had them just laying in the machines, not doing any mental act tasks, they noticed that they were having a lot of brain activity. And they said, well, what is that? What is that brain activity when they're laying there? And what they realized is that people that are laying there and don't have anything going on are doing self-referential thoughts. So they're thinking about themselves, the trials, the tribulations, the things that they need to do, other people. And that self-referential thought was kicking on this uh, network, this brain circuit network that they that he called default mode network. And the hubs of the network were the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate, and the angular gyrus. So this network represents when you are uh, inside your own head and thinking about yourself. And from there, they were able to find quite a few different, uh, different networks depending on what you have going on. And uh, these networks will change subtly depending on where your focus is, uh, what you're doing at that time, and just a lot of research coming out of that. Default mode network in particular has been picked up by modern uh, media and uh, popular reading. Uh, Stephen Kotler, one of my uh, favorite authors, and uh, Jason Silva, who uh, does Shots for Awe, uh, one of my favorite uh, po poetic videographers, are there talking together. And they talk about the default mode network quite a bit. And the idea is that you need to get out of default mode network to get into something called flow state. And Stephen Kotler's uh, founded the uh, flow genome project. And what that has to do with is uh, training, because when you're in flow, you're very present, you're creative, uh, you make decisions very quickly. And as you can imagine, this is really important for uh, high intensity situations like Navy SEAL training and can be developed more through uh, meditation. So again, being picked up by uh, popular media and authors and being utilized this very day. So it's really cool to see neuroscience be used in, in those ways. Uh, this is a number of articles that I'm going to talk about right now that talk about uh, the actual brain networks, connectivity of brain networks, and that's where we're going. So in discussing this, it's important to mention that the way that we can actually parse these different clusters of brain networks has really only been made possible by machine learning. The nuances of these functional brain MRI scans and the amount of data that's required to actually parse out where the brain circuits are and how they're different in different people has really only been possible within the last 10 years or so by using machine learning. Uh, here you see uh, an out, like a image uh, representing what machine learning does. It takes input of a bunch of different brain scans, puts them into the uh, machine learning algorithms, which determine different classifiers more than the human mind could ever hope to put together in terms of uh, comparing data and puts out its findings. So we're going to be seeing this more and more in neurology where it can detect things like hemorrhage, stroke, tumor, or normal. But in psychiatry, as it becomes more and more uh, powerful and nuanced, we're seeing not only differences in uh, the actual imaging that would detect like a tumor or a stroke, but actual imaging differences in the functional anatomy of the brain. So the blood flow of the brain, depending on what the person is doing or what they've reported in terms of symptoms to reflect uh, what we call psychiatric disorders, which are actually, um, if you think about it, behavior is manifested through how the brain is working. So you can see how the brain is working. It can uh, explain the behavior that you see on the outside. And psychiatrists are trained to look at the behavior of people and diagnose with that. But the problem with that is that is a very relatively unreliable to other medical specialties. So the idea is that taking a look at the brain and how the brain reacts is a really good biomarker for understanding why people are behaving in a certain way. And that allows us to make much more certain uh, diagnoses about how to help people with depression, anxiety, psychosis, and, and being able to diagnose better lead to better treatments for people. And as you guys know, I'm thinking about this a lot as I get into using the Muse device and taking a look at these different broad range frequencies in bio and neurofeedback and understanding that those frequency patterns are reflecting the firing of these different brain networks 
and allowing me to see deeper into the things like the Muse data and like extrapolate from uh, bio and neurofeedback data of what actually is going on in the mind with the brain with these different brain circuits. So when we're looking at functional MRI, we're looking at how well different areas of the brain are communicating to each other. And you can see that in some cases, the communication between different areas of the brain is higher than normal or less than normal. And those differences indicate uh, some abnormalities in the brain scan that might explain behaviors that people have. For instance, if someone has a lot of fear in their life, a lot of anxiety, the amygdala is the fight or flight center of the brain. And typically when we get startled, our frontal lobe of the brain, which does something called executive control, which is us. Like imagine if you got scared and you're trying to calm yourself down, you're mentally telling yourself, it's okay, calm down. You know, there's not really anything to be worried about. That process is very healthy. And that conscious process is done by the frontal lobe. Well, you can see in these brain scans that people that have a lot of anxiety have less connectivity between their frontal lobe and the amygdala, and it lets the amygdala run amok, basically. So these people that have a lot of fear in their lives, the amygdala is really uh, running away with things and making things worse and worse, and their frontal lobe doesn't have a very good connection to calm it down. And you really do see that in these brain scans. Another thing that you see is for schizophrenia, um, you know, we talked about the default mode network. Well, the default mode network for self-referential thought is usually very well um, separated from the other networks. If you're in the default mode network and having self-referential thought, you're very aware that you're in your own head and thinking, whereas if you're paying attention to things, uh, you're subconsciously aware that you're outside of your head. But what happens when those two get um, melded together? What happens when the communication pathways are not very well parsed out? Well, you definitely see that in schizophrenia. You see a breakdown of the segregation between default mode network and executive networks. And that could be an explanation of why people are experiencing voices in their head or uh, delusions. You know, that is represented in the brain scan, and that is very, very interesting. So you can see as these different brain networks alter and change and communicate differently, that actually uh, illustrates the subjective experience of the person. And we're seeing more and more with these brain scans that uh, you can use machine learning to parse people out into different categories. You know, and that sounds bad. That sounds um, kind of mechanistic. You know, oh, you're shuttling people into different categories. Well, yeah, it's like it's scientific research, you know, I'm not obviously not going to treat an individual person as a category, but the overall science needs to progress so that we understand what different categories people are most related to so we can give them the best treatments. And as you'll see, uh, in this one paper, they parsed out different types of depression based on brain scans rather than just lumping people into one category. And that really led to a lot better treatment outcomes with technology called transmagnetic stimulation. And we'll take a look at that paper here in a little bit. But first, I want to finish up talking about this data-driven science of using uh, these brain scans. So as you can imagine, this would be an unimaginable amount of data being fed into these systems. And to uh, reduce the amount of processing power that's required by the computer, they actually set up what are called nodes in the brain. So they've got these little points along the brain where they're looking at the different brain activity. And then they use the computer to determine how often each node is turning on at the same time as other nodes to determine if they're communicating or not and create these uh, color bitmaps. And what they do is use that data and compare it to questionnaires that people had taken. So the questionnaires will parse out whether it looks like someone has a lot of anxiety or has mood problems or maybe has psychosis or ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, all these different categories. And then it gets fed into the machine learning system, which determines, all right, if this person has this brain scan and they answered the questions this way, you know, what similarities is that data set to a different person that answered questions this way and has this brain scan? Are there similarities there? And it creates these uh, these patterns or it groups people into these categories depending on how they answered the questions and what their brain scans look like. And what you get are these different connection patterns depending on what people's uh, 
supposed diagnosis is. So you can see in this picture that there's different connectivity pattern for what's called externalizing behavior, which would be ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder, um, fear, which would be uh, more reflected in anxiety, psychosis, or mood. <clears throat> and this is just one of very many studies that are going to come after this that are uh, you know, breaking things into subcategories and determining uh, at what resolution we want to understand because each person is going to have their individual brain scan, but there are similarities that can help guide treatment. So as you can see, there's different connectivity patterns represented in this diagram for uh, mood psychosis, fear, and externalizing behavior. Uh, if you look at these circles, those are the nodes that I talked about earlier. Those are the nodes that got picked out on the um, structural anatomy of the brain, and each of the lines indicates how often that they're communicating to each other. And the width of the lines actually indicates uh, the strength of that connection. So you can see there's different patterns for different um, findings. And they found that some things like irritability that they more likely would have lumped into mood more often were actually um, more along the lines of externalizing behavior. So that is an illustration of what a psychiatrist would usually see, like, oh, they're irritable. Like, that's a sign of someone being depressed. But the brain scan suggests that the irritability probably has something more to do with externalizing behavior like uh, ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. So right then and there, suggesting that, uh, you know, the, the way that we pick out these symptoms and categorize people in the DSM right now is incorrect, that we need these biomarkers to further educate ourselves and have more data about the decisions that we're making in mental health and being able to understand the, the brain and the mind better. Because really what this is doing is merging neuroscience and uh, clinical psychology. And that's, I think, the ultimate goal here. So in this study, they were taking a look at depression. And really what they found was uh, four different biotypes of depression. Uh, an example would be that uh, low connectivity between the frontal lobe and the amygdala that I talked about before where people are very scared because their amygdala is running amok and then a different uh, biotype that had to do with people that are more likely to be uh, very low mood not motivated to get out of bed and uh, unable to feel joy so that's the anhedonic subtype and there was a different connectivity pattern for that one and what they found, and this is why this is important, is that it guides treatment. So there's something called transmagnetic stimulation that I'm going to make a video on. We actually use magnetic pulses to stimulate parts of the brain. And they were able to increase the efficacy of transmagnetic stimulation by three times the normal amount by targeting a specific biotype. And that biotype was the dysregulation between the frontal lobe and the amygdala. So the brain scan actually tells you which type of depression would be most responsive to that treatment really increasing the effectiveness of that treatment. And uh, we, we had a transmagnetic stimulation uh, clinic come to uh, my clinic about six weeks ago just to present what they were doing. And you look on their website and there it is. You know, they offer things like quantitative EEG and fMRI to take a look at uh, how your brain is functioning in order to guide their treatment because there's different stimulation points that you can do for TMS depending on um, what your brain looks like. And it's funny looking back to Daniel Amen 10 to 20 years ago and, and having him been under so much attack for doing something similar with SPEC. Um, again, I don't know if SPEC was a fine resolution or not to really guide treatment. He would argue it was. A lot of people argued that it was not. But now it's becoming common practice, which is really, really interesting. So you just see these different functional connectivity networks. And that's really how it's working. That's how uh, my understanding of these different brain circuits turning on and off, depending on where your awareness and your perception is, uh, has shaped my understanding of what's happening in meditation. Because if you think about it, these um, meditations goal, and we see this in uh, different papers that are published in uh, really well-regarded scientific journals, is that meditation doesn't necessarily turn on different areas of the brain at higher levels, what it does is uh, turn on more areas of the brain, has more areas of the brain communicating to each other and spreads out these resonance patterns. So going from high frequency patterns of uh, beta gamma in local areas of the brain to having different areas of the brain on uh, a more widespread scale communicate to each other in lower frequency patterns like alpha theta and that's really what the muse device rewards 
are those alpha theta frequencies. So I think that going through different focus points um, opens up these different brain pathways and you can use the muse to ground yourself back into um, the alpha theta. And in doing those processes and going through the, these different techniques and exercises, you can really get really, really good meditation sessions. And I think that where this is going and you know, one of the medical students brought this up during my lecture. One of the big, one of the main, um, you know, problems with this is that MRI is very expensive. They cost several thousands of dollars. So you can't exactly expect everybody to get a brain scan before, um, you know, undergoing TMS or what I hope to in the future do is, you know, just self-development training after getting a brain scan. Cause you'd be able to look at the, the brain scan and see where areas can be improved and then uh, go into things like neuro and biofeedback or other direct electrical stimulation devices to enhance your cognition. So that's hopefully coming in the future. But uh, you can't do that when MRI machines and the cost of actually doing the scans costs thousands of dollars. And this is where Mary Lou Jepsen really comes into the picture. Uh, if you haven't seen my previous video, I'll put a link here below where she... Uh, you know, was working in Facebook and Google, Google X on optics and with Oculus. And she left in 2014 or 2015 to start her own company called Open Water, which is uh, developing technology called near infrared spectroscopy. So the idea is that near infrared light penetrates biological tissue, but it gets diffused quite a bit. And in order to make an image from it, we needed to use uh, holography, which recollects light into an image and uh, our computing power that's really developed over the last uh, 10, 20, 30 years to reassimilate the image. And in doing so, we'll dramatically reduce the cost of doing a brain scan. So no longer would you have to have this giant magnet and a technician that needs to read the MRI. You would have uh, these LEDs that would emit near infrared light and then computer chips to pick up that light and reassimilate the image being small enough to fit into something like a ski cap. And this is not super out there, space age technology. I mean, I was just in Washington, D.C. for a conference by the Department of Defense talking about traumatic brain injury. And the FDA has already approved a near infrared de device for trying to detect traumatic brain injury. Uh, and this is a picture of it here. Now, granted, it's not. Uh, near to the level of accuracy that uh, Mary Lou Jepsen wants to get in order to have fMRI-like capabilities for looking at uh, the connectome of the brain and different connectomics to diagnose people with uh, psychiatric disorders. However, the fact that the technology is there, it does have the potential to get much better. And there already are devices that are approved by the FDA that use near-infrared light to uh, make certain diagnoses. So the technology is there. Uh, she just gave her next uh, TED Talk this last spring in April uh, saying that Open Water has a prototype and you guys can watch that. It's available on YouTube now and you can see the prototype shine light through um, a uh, model that mimics uh, brain and skull density and recollects the light through holography and assimilates the image. They're, they claim that they can get to down to the resolution of a single neuron. So if this technology really comes forward and really develops, we're going to have much cheaper brain imaging technology to support what we're learning through uh, functional MRI studies to have a better access to looking at these brain circuits, not only for uh, psychiatry and psychiatric diagnoses, but for uh, personal self-development. And that's really where I'm headed with Tech for Psych is you know bringing that, that picture of using technology and the mind to further develop ourselves for self-development purposes really that's where that's all headed um, of course we have to be skeptical and i've brought up this curve multiple times before it's called the gartner hype cycle uh, we have to be uh, careful about innovation triggers that get picked up by the media and people hype it up so hopefully i'm not doing too much of this right now you know hyping it up unnecessarily because what would happen is that when the technology comes along uh, people get disappointed because they don't the technology doesn't live up to their expectations and there's something called the trough of disillusionment i usually get a pretty big laugh when from when i give lectures on this topic because people just love that that terminology trough of disillusionment it's kind of fun and morbid but then after that you get the slope of enlightenment where you get second and third generations of devices coming out that build upon upon the initial model and make it better and better 
So we would see that with this brain scan technology, maybe like the first prototype coming out. It's pretty awesome. Uh, it's revolutionary, but maybe not to the level that people thought that it would be. But then with time, it just gets better and better. And so hopefully that's what we're going to be coming up against here. It's funny when I give this talk because I talk a lot about machine learning and the capabilities of it. And when you look at this graph, machine learning is right there at the peak of inflated expectations, at least in 2016 when Gartner published this. And brain-computer interface is there to the left um, with that color scheme of orange saying that it's going to be more than 10 years when it comes online. But as I've said before, I, I don't think that it's like a yay or a nay on brain-computer interface. I mean, we're already doing brain-computer interface with things like the Muse. It just depends on the level of sophistication that you want. So it, in looking at overall brain waves and that reflecting different subjective states, we're already there. Hopefully the next step will be using something like near-infrared spectroscopy to be able to make inferences on which networks like the default mode network or task positive network are turning on in someone's brain and use that for neurofeedback and self-development. And then, uh, you know, just take it step and step further from there. So this is Dr. Cody Rall with Tech for Psych. Thanks so much for listening. Hope to talk to you again sometime soon. Thanks. Bye.